thanks for the for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so since uh, so the conference was delayed by a year or so, and since then I'm actually um, based at ICFO Barcelona. And uh, and this one year was also just enough to to actually publish this work. It really took a lot of time, but it's now it's now published here and it's uh, it's open access. So we we actually paid a lot of a lot of taxpayers' money on this. So you can check it out here. Obviously, it's also in the archive. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, you can download it for free. And uh, okay, so before we start, I would just like to thank the, the organizers for the persistence during this one year that they pushed through with organizing this uh, this event. Despite being online, it's, it's still a great event. And uh, and obviously also for the program committee for putting together such a, a great selection of talks, probably like apart from this one, but like the rest all look pretty, pretty interesting. So I will talk about my talk is based on this paper, but actually it's not not the full content of the paper because we have kind of many things. So it's it's based on let's say half of this paper, and uh, and it's called mutually biased measurement and Bellman locality. So to start, I will talk about uh, first mutually biased bases, and notice that this is not exactly the same as mutually biased measurements. Um, Mutually biased measurements will be sort of a generalization of, of mutually biased bases or MUBs. So MUBs are quite a well-established notion in quantum info, I would say. So it's kind of it's instructive to go through what they are and why they are relevant in quantum info. So first we will think of, of MUBs as just two orthonormal bases on the B-dimensional complex Hilbert space. Uh, collection of factors B and Q. And we say that two bases are mutually biased whenever you pick one vector from one basis and another vector from another basis, then the, the modulus of the inner product will be constant, well, uniform. Any vector you pick from one basis and, and another vector from another basis, um, the, this overlap will always be the same. And this number is, is one over the dimension, but uh, I mean, the, the important thing is that it's constant. The, the exact number is just comes from the fact that these uh, states should be, these vectors should be normalized. And uh, the kind of standard example in, in any dimension B is the eigenbasis of the, of the Heisenberg file operators. So these are the, well, if you're, if you're familiar with this, it's these uh, clock and shift operators. Um, if you're not that familiar with it, then Almost surely you know the two-dimensional example, which is simply the, the power dz and x matrices, and the corresponding eigenbases are, say, the computational basis and then the, the Hadamard basis, the plus minus vectors. These two bases form an MUB, um, a pair of MUBs in dimension two. So so far these are these are bases in the Hilbert space, but obviously for every such basis there's a corresponding there's a corresponding sorry, um, rank from projective measurement. Um, so whenever you have a basis, you have a corresponding measurement. And in this talk, I will, I will call these measurements MUBs as well. I do not really distinguish between, between bases and, and rank from projective measurements. And these measurements turn out to be very useful in, in various quantum information processing tasks, such as state determination or various quantum communication tasks. I won't really go into many details on this, Maybe the next talk by Kuba, you will hear some more. I'm not sure, um, but kind of the only the only thing I will focus in this talk on uh, regarding MUBs is their role in Bellman locality. So luckily, we've heard uh, today some talks on Bellman locality. Uh, for example, in Jed Kanievsky's talk just before lunch, we we actually heard about the CHS inequality, which might make my job a little bit easier. So I will just stick to this bipartite scenario. There is no, there is no network on locality here. I'm just considering two parties, Alice and Bob, and they share some some quantum state role. Um, and in this simple scenario, both of them have two measurement settings. These are denoted by x and y, and both of them have two possible outcomes denoted by a and b. And the way they they obtain these outcomes is simply by measuring. Some, some P or on, on their part of the quantum state. 
So I would denote Alice's measurement by A, X, A, um, and Bob's measurement. So he has two measurements, the one corresponding to Y equals zero, I will call P, and the other one Q. And we will mostly be interested in Bob's measurements in, 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 our, in this talk. So in Bergman locality, um, as we've heard before in a few talks, um, what we'll be mostly interested in is to, is to deduce some properties of the, of the quantum state and the measurement while assuming that we only have access to, the, to these measurement outcome probabilities. What is the probability that I observe the outcome A and B, given that the measurement settings were X and Y? And this is simply written by the Bohm rule. In, in, in the trace of the product of the row with A and P, uh, P for Y equals zero or Q for Y equals one. So from this data, I, will, I will try to deduce something about the underlying state and the measurements. And for the CHSH case, we, we use the CHSH inequality, um, which is where the CHSH functional is a, just a linear combination of, of, of some of these, uh, these probabilities. We've seen this expression also earlier in, in, in Peter's talk. And we know, so do we know this inequality very well, and we know that the maximum value that we can reach using some quantum state and measurements in any dimensional Hilbert space is two times root two. This is the zero sum bound. And uh, so this in itself is kind of interesting, and we know that this is a larger value than we can achieve in a, in a, a local realistic way. But what's more, and what we also heard in, in Jed's talk earlier, is that whenever we reach this maximal value, then actually we can say a lot about these, the, the state and the measurements as well. In particular, I will just say that um, Bob's measurements will always satisfy these constraints. The first two essentially just tell us that uh, the measurements are projective, and this one is a, so this is the empty commutator of these, uh, of these observables, basically. So in, in Jet's talk, we had the observables, I will just write it out in terms of the, of the measurement operators. But you can say that whenever you see the maximal violation of the CHSH inequality, then Bob's operators must satisfy these constraints. In fact, also Alice's operators, but um, I will just focus on, on one side now. And this turns out to be very strong. Actually, this means that Bob's measurements must be must correspond to a pair of MUVs up to some extra degrees of freedom and the local unitary. And this is what's called self-testing. And this is what was also mentioned earlier today. So in particular, we know that um, the first measurement uh, the first measurement operator of the first measurement of Bob is up to a unitary, basically the, the zero zero projector on, on a two dimensional Hilbert space. There is some additional degree of freedom and this U uh, picks us the basis. So basically up to, these, uh, up to these degrees of freedom, we have a pair of MUVs on Bob's side. And these self-testing results are, are connected to some applications in particular, whenever we observe uh, the maximal violation or even close to the maximal violation, this can be used for device independent random number generation, which just means that essentially based on the, on the outcome statistics, just on the bell violation, um, and assuming the correctness of quantum theory, Alice and Bob can, uh, can uh, extract secure random numbers uh, that are well, that appear random to any potential eavesdropper, let's say. And uh, one can say even stronger results that uh, a, these, uh, these random numbers are actually also correlated, and this can then be used for device-independent quantum key distribution. So these are uh, quite well-established uh, results. And uh, the question is what we will tackle here is what happens if we, if we want to move to higher dimensions. So essentially everything here can be achieved with, with qubits. We don't need to use qubits, but essentially like, the interesting things always happen on a two dimensional subspace. But uh, the properties of MUVs actually kind of intuitively suggest that higher dimensional MUVs might also be useful for, for device independent information processing, for example, random number generation or key distribution. And this is also potentially practically useful because 
in higher dimensions, the, the outcomes come from a larger alphabet, which allows for higher rates in principle in, in one measurement round. Instead of extracting a bit, I, I extract a bit, which, is a, uh, which gives me a larger rate. Um, so in order to tackle this question, what we need is a device independent characterization of higher dimensional NUVs, which would be the, the analog of this characterization that we had from the CHS agent quality, which was the projectivity of the measurements and this, this uh, empty commutation relation, which essentially up to some trivial uh, equivalences characterizes a pair of MUVs in dimension two. So this is what we need now for, for higher dimensions. So in what we, what we need is three things. Uh, it should be an algebraic characterization of the measurement operators. It should not refer to the Hilbert space dimension because in, in device independent protocols, we, we, we cannot assume the dimension of the Hilbert space. We, we only have access to the, to the outcome statistics. And uh, it should still somehow capture some essential properties of MUVs. So even if we're not able to, to completely identify MUVs without referring to the Hilbert space dimension, it should somehow, somehow capture the properties that make MUVs useful in quantum information processing. So the property that we will characterize is, uh, is complementarity. So if we go back to the, to just a normal definition of MUVs, but now we give an equivalent definition, which is based on, on complementarity. And I'll just tell you roughly what complementarity means. But so far, what we have here is an equivalent uh, definition of, of MUVs in dimension D. So there are two projective measurements on, on a D-dimensional Hilbert space, such that whenever we have a state which gives a definite outcome on one of the measurements, so if I measure P, I always get uh, the outcome A with probability one. If I have such a state and I measure Q on the same state, then the outcome will be you know, uniformly random. And also the other way around, if I have a state that has a definite outcome in Q, then if I measure P, the outcome will be completely random. So this is in a sense uh, means that P and Q are maximally uh, complementary. Um, so this is kind of the, this is a nice operational definition of, of MUVs because uh, we can see what, what the meaning is for two bases to be mutually unbiased. Um, but note that this, this definition is still not device independent because we explicitly refer to the Hilbert space dimension here. So what we do next is, is generalize this definition into a device independent setting and the measurements satisfying this definition, we will call mutually unbiased measurements instead of mutually unbiased bases. And the way we, we uh, make the device independent definition is kind of very, very brutal. We just take the, the MUV definition and simply forget about the, the Hilbert space dimension. But still, we need two projected measurements with the outcomes, such that if I have a definite outcome on one measurement, then the other, me other measurement gives me a uh, completely random outcome. So this is operational. And uh, we can show that actually this, this definition is equivalent to this algebraic characterization. So now I'm, I'm given two POVMs with the outcome each. On some Hilbert space, I don't need to specify the dimension. And they have to satisfy these, these uh, relations. Um, so this is an algebraic characterization. It only it only refers to the POVM elements. It doesn't refer to the to the uh, Hilbert space dimension, and it captures this complementarity. And so this is a device independent characterization. And in fact, one can see that if I take these measurements to be rank one, uh, these these give me back the MUV definition. So in fact, from these from these two relations, well, there's not two, there's actually many relations, but these two types of relations, you can already see that uh, these measurements are projective. For example, here, if I sum up all the P, um, on the left-hand side, I just get PA squared. On the right-hand side, I get D times this, which is just PA. So P is projective, similarly, Q is projective. And one can see, if you plug in these, uh, these uh, formulas, if you plug in uh, just a rank one projector, um, you will exactly get back the, the MUV definition. So 
Now we have a, a device independent characterization of these, of these pairs of measurements. So let's see if this is really kind of the right, the correct device independent notion of, of uh, being mutually unbiased. And I will try to argue on this slide that it is actually in many senses, it's, it's, it's the correct device independent notion. And so one thing is that if these measurements have very similar properties to NUBs, and I will highlight two, one of them is entropic uncertainties. So if I take any state and I collect the measurement out from the probabilities under P, this will give me some probability distribution and I can compute the, the Shannon entropy of this distribution. Um, this is this HP, this depends on some state. I take the same state, I, I compute the, out, the entropy of the outcome uh, probability distribution Q, and if I add these two, this must be greater than log D for any state. So the right-hand side of this is a, is a state-independent thing. And this is exactly the, the same entropic uncertainty relation that we, uh, that we get for, for NUBs. So we get this also for, for NUNs. So they have, in this sense, they are, they are straightforward general, generalization of, of NUBs. And also uh, another thing is uh, incompatibility robustness, which is a kind of a measure of how not jointly measurable a pair of uh, measurements are. And there are actually many different measures that people use to, to quantify this, but under the kind of uh, usually used measures, we get the same values as for NUBs. So they, they behave uh, the same way in these kind of incompatibility scenarios. Moreover, if we take uh, outcome numbers two and three, we can show that whenever we have a D outcome a pair of NUMs, they will always, they can always be written, there's a basis in which they can be written as a direct sum of D dimensional NUBs. So your Hilbert space will be a, a direct sum of D dimensional spaces, and on each of these subspaces, the measurements act as a, as a rank on projectors onto a pair of MUBs. For example, if you take the B equals two case, the, the MUM construction is completely equivalent to, to, to what you can certify in the CHSH scenario. So every pair of MU, MUMs can be written in some basis, which is defined by this U unitary as, as a tensor product of, of MUBs with identity. You can also think of this as a, if this space has N dimensions, let's say, then this is n copies of, of a pair of MUBs. So you can see that they are they are very similar to, to MUBs. Now we turn on to the to the cases when they are a little bit different. So if we go on to larger outcome numbers, four, five, and six, then uh, we find that they're actually strictly more general in the sense that we find examples of MUBs, MUMs, sorry, that are not direct sums of, of D-dimensional MUBs. And moreover, they cannot even be mapped to a pair of MUBs with, uh, with any completely positive unit of map. So one might think that whenever I have a pair of MUMs, I can in some way find a pair of MUBs in them. But even in the, in the quite, with this quite gener general map, you will not be able to do that. So it's, it's really a strictly more general concept. And also, if you pick an outcome number D, um, the, the number of measurements that are pairwise mutually unbiased will be unbounded, which is again uh, different from MUBs, where for d dimensional MUBs you always have at most d plus one pairwise uh, MUBs. But also for this, uh, in order to, to construct an unbounded number of MUMs, you will need an unbounded dimension. And okay, so, so we have these uh, MUMs which are very closely related to MUBs. And then the last thing I will show you is how to characterize, how to certify them in a device independent manner. So we take, again, a Bell scenario. This will be parameterized by an integer D, which will be our outcome number. So on both sides, again, we have two measurements with D outcomes each, P and Q. And we want to certify these measurements based on the outcome uh, probability in this Bell scenario. So we, we come up with some Bell functionals for each D. Um, we find the optimal quantum value for these functionals, and moreover, we show that 
uh, for these bell functionals, the maximum violation certified exactly the MUM property. So whenever you observe the maximum violation in our bell inequalities, you can be sure that uh, the measurements on both sides must correspond to a pair of MU MUMs. And what we also see in our bell scenario is that the optimal uh, outcome statistics that, that uh, maximize our bell functional, they are extremal in the set of quantum correlations, but this certification of the measurement measurements is not a self-test. This is basically because uh, there exist even pairs of MUBs, you don't even need to go to MUMs, there exist pairs of MUBs that are not related by a single unitary. So this certification does not identify your measurements up to um, potentially actual degrees of freedom and uh, local unitary. So it's not a self-test. It's actually the first example that, that we know about, which is an extremal point of the quantum set of correlations, but it's not a self-test, provably not a self-test. Um, and this actually kind of raises the question, what can you say whenever there's an extremal point of the quantum set, how much can you certify about the underlying quantum realization? And uh, an application of this device independent certification is, uh, is device independent quantum key distribution. So if we, if we add another setting for Alice with, uh, with D outcomes that is correlated with one of the measurements of Bob, you can actually certify log D bits of, of secure key from the optimal correlations, which is essentially the, the theoretical maximum that you can get out of D outcome measurements. Okay, so to summarize uh, this talk, we introduced a device independent characterization of, of mutual unbiasedness. We got measurements that have very similar properties to, to those of MUBs, but if the outcome number is at least four, we see that actually the, these measurements are strictly more general than MUBs themselves. Then we devised a, a device independent certification for these measurements, which turned out to be not a self test, which is a, which is a new feature. And we also apply a certificate for device independent quantum key distribution. And also in the paper, uh, we have a, a kind of similar program for symmetric informationally complete projections. We, we come up with a device independence characterization of those and a device independent certification for these measurements and apply our certificates for device independent random number generation. Uh, Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Mute. So <clears throat> we have time, I think, for one question only. And this is uh, the question asked by Jarek, but I also thought about this question when I was listening to you. Can you give any insight why there are more MUMs than MUVs? So if you think of the, so this already happened in the, in the two outcome case. So when you, when you think of the CHS hedge inequality and what you need to maximally violate it, basically what you need is that your observables anti-commute and they are projective. And simply when you start increasing the dimension, um, you can always find an arbitrary number of pairwise anti-commuting observables um, in a larger dimensional Hilbert space. You can start taking like tens of lots of Pauli's and as you increase the dimension, you can you can always find arbitrary many that will pairwise commute. I'm not sure this counts as, a, as intuition, but sort of this is how you this is how you construct them. I think like yes, as you start increasing the dimension, there's simply more space to to satisfy all these uh, all these constraints. Since in the in the definition of MUMs, you need to drop the the Hilbert space dimension assumption. Um, it kind of, it just makes room for, for more observables to satisfy this constraint. Okay, uh, so thank you once again for this talk.